Uh, John chapter 19 tonight. John 19. Getting close to finishing up the book of John, and tonight we're going to be looking at the crucifixion of Christ. So, one of uh, probably the most important story in all the Bible. This is where our sins get paid for. This is why we can go to heaven because our debt was paid. It was paid by Jesus Christ, the only one who could have paid the debt because he was the only one who ever lived a sinless life. He was the Son of God, and that's why he's the only Savior, the only way to heaven. And uh, it's, it's the truth. When you say Jesus is the only Savior, you offend billions of people, apparently, by saying that. But uh, that's because we've let the news media and the you know, secular society you know, make Christianity out to be some you know, white person thing. And that's, that is not what it is. Jesus Christ was the Savior for the entire world. He died and he paid for the sins of the entire world. Anyone from any country, of any race, can be saved and because he died for the sins of the whole world. And so this is not, uh, it's, it's not, it's not racist to say that. It's not being discriminatory. It's just a fact. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And a lot of people don't like that. Well, and there's a good reason it told us at the beginning of John, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Yeah. And if they come to the light, which is Jesus Christ, then their deeds would be reproved. And they're not interested in that. They, they want to be able to go on in blissful ignorance, living wicked lives. And that's just all there is to it. And uh, we've just got to understand that you know people are wicked. Even some people who are nice looking people who do good things for society are wicked people. And I don't know, I just feel led tonight too to single out someone who is wicked uh, in our state. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, pe- but people are they're wicked. I-, I don't care what they've done for charity. I don't care uh, you know who they are, what they've accomplished. There are some people that are just downright wicked, and uh, you know, Jesus died for those people too. Uh, you know, I-, I know there's such thing as reprobates. This guy I'm talking about tonight, he might be one. I don't know. I don't know for sure. This is a guy who's been featured and honored in fundamental Baptist churches recently that I'm just a little irritated with right now. But anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'll give you something to look forward to. I I was reading some stuff, and I was just kind of reminded of this guy when I was reading some things in the story. And then uh, I I had heard this on the news, couldn't believe it. And then uh, you know, I was reading the story about it, and sure enough, it just made me sick. And so anyway, John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Now understand, uh, up before this point, Jesus, he had kind of had that mock trial. Okay? He's, he's put out there. They've already decided what they want to do with him. They, uh, they want him dead. They want him crucified. They're, they didn't even try to be fair. And the Jews, who were pretty wicked, all right, they turned him over to the hands of the Romans, who were just even more vile. And notice how as soon as Jesus gets into the hands of the Romans, they just start doing horrible, degrading things. I mean, they're, just, they're, they're having fun with this. Oh, this guy is the king of the Jews, so what do they do? They make a crown of thorns. That wasn't a normal thing that they did in an execution, but it was something that they did to him. You know, why, why did they tr- choose to do that? Well, we know when it came to uh, the Jews and their treatment of Jesus, it was because they rejected him. They hated his message. But the, when it came to the Romans, they really were ignorant about what they were doing. They were just a bunch of savages. And, they, and so they did. Oh, this guy's the king of the Jews. Let's make a crown for him. And so they put that you know, crown on his head. You know, uh, another guy, uh, one of the other accounts, it talks about how they took a reed and they smote him on the head with it and they put this purple robe on him and start saying hail king of the jews i mean they're making a mockery of this they're they're mocking him they are having fun while getting ready to execute a man and listen i believe in execution for people who deserve it i absolutely believe it but i don't think we ought to have fun with it i don't think it ought to be an enjoyable thing it ought to be a sad thing it ought to be something we take serious but these people are a bunch of savage animals these romans the, the Jews turned Jesus over to. It was a horrible, cruel thing. You know, they had their own laws. They had their own thing, you know, ways of dealing with things. But no, they wanted him turned over to the Romans. And you can see why. They knew what kind of treatment he'd get. 
They'd seen the way they had treated people that they had executed before. And they did. They turned him over to a bunch of savages. You know, many people historically, they look at Rome like they were this great example of human evolution. You know, because of some of their, you know, architecture or even because of their government, uh, their form of government that they had. But listen, these were a people of false gods and therefore they were savages. And ultimately that's why they fell. These were a a wicked, immoral people that were, they, they were, they were vile to the biggest extremes. They were perverted when you study their history. And listen, just because they accomplished some things when it came to you know architecture, or when it came to uh, you know even just a form of government and military strength, things like that, when you are morally bankrupt, okay, you are doomed to fall. And in America today, we've accomplished some great things financially. We've accomplished great things architecturally, militarily. But as we go downhill morally, it's only a matter of time, and we're done for, Amen. because it. You know, we are not evolving because of the fact that we have all these great technologies and great medicines. Thank God for, you know, things like that that have been accomplished. But as long as the moral deterioration of this country goes on, it's only a matter of time before we're completely destroyed. Because we are. Our country is getting looking more like a bunch of savages today. And we do. And so we see just how wicked these Romans are. I mean, Jesus got treated pretty bad by the Jews. They probably would have done worse to him if they could have, but here now they've turned, given him into the hands of the Romans. And I mean, you know, look at, you know, look at what's the way they're treating him. And so, uh, but you know, Pont- Pontius Pilate verse, uh, look at verse four. It says, and Pilate therefore went forth again and said, them, behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. So, you know, Pilate, once again, we looked at this last week, you know, he, he can't find anything wrong with Jesus. He can't find any fault in him. Okay, Jesus, he was taken to the cross. He was executed against the law. It was according to the, God's will because he needed to pay for sins. But Jesus could not break any law. He was the sinless son of God. And he didn't. He didn't break any law. And Pilate, he was, he was, he was just kind of a, he was a coward. You know, just kind of an interesting thing about, about Pontius Pilate. You know, here he, you know, he is the, you know, governor uh, of Judea during that time. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing about Pilate is for years, people said that historically there was no proof that Pilate ever existed. For years they said that, which is like, you know how stupid that is? Because why aren't the Gospels considered historical? I mean, they've been around... You know, copies of these things have been around since the time of Christ, yet that doesn't count as history. But I love how, you know, we have all these writings, and he's even mentioned in some of the apocryphal writings, but that doesn't even count as history. And, you know, I say this all the time. We'll have, we have all these copies. You even have things like the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, those don't mention Pilate, but those don't count as history when it lines with the Scripture. But they'll find a carving on a rock somewhere, and that proves all kinds of things historically. And interestingly enough, when I was in Israel, they had a replica there in a place where they, in 1961, they found uh, what they they call it the Pilate Stone. They found a stone. I don't remember what all it said on it, but it had the name Pontius Pilate on it. And it dated back to the time of Christ. And so now, historically, they recognize that Pontius Pilate existed. And it it shows how stupid our history is. You know, that, you know, they... Things are historical facts when it goes along with the mainstream idea of things. And, you know, they, they have such an agenda. But let's keep reading verse 5. So then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. So, you know, Pilate, you know, he's, he, I, when he's saying, you know, take him and crucifying, for I find no fault, it was like, I don't want to do this. You know, you take him and do it, which it wasn't lawful, we see in chapter 18, verse 31, it wasn't lawful for them to put any man to death. And it's like the Jews, you know, they're wanting, 
the Rome to do their dirty work for them. Rome, you know, Pilate doesn't even want to do it because he knows there's nothing wrong with this man. And so, but they are, they're trying, they're kind of forcing him. You know what they're doing? They're using the stinking government to their advantage. Yeah. They're using a wicked government to their advantage. They're using a government that they knew was their enemy to their advantage. Why? Because you know they, they knew they were a bunch of savages. They, they wanted them to take Jesus. They wanted them to brutally kill him. And it was like they didn't want to do it themselves. Pilate didn't want to do it, but they, they kind of forced him to do it. They, pr- they put the pressure on. And like all politicians, he gave in to the pressure. Like all stinking politicians, he gave in to the pressure. You know, and God, God's people should never, ever use worldly courts, use worldly government to deal with their brothers in Christ. Okay, Understand, Jesus was one of them. He was a Jew like one of them. But instead of them just dealing with it in-house, they, they used the strong arm of the Roman government to do their dirty work for them. And listen, I don't believe Christians ought to go to court with each other. Amen. I don't believe we ought to be suing each other. I think if, if there's a problem, if there's a conflict, I think you need to figure out how to work it out amongst yourselves. And you know, today, you know, because our government's so ridiculous, you know, we can't really handle all financial disputes and things like that in church, you know, it, but at the same time, you know, you could, I, I think it would be appropriate if you had some kind of conflict, I think you would be better off taking anyone in the church, you know, don't bring it before the whole church necessarily and make us all vote on it and stuff like that. That's just ridiculous. But you take anyone. Bible says take the least esteemed person in the church. And you say, listen, here's what happened. Here's both sides. And you both agree we will do whatever he says. You would be better off doing that than you would be going to court for anything. And we should should not use them. Listen, when it's worldly people, they're obviously not going to go along with that. Sometimes you might have to deal with that. But if you can take the wrong, if you're capable of doing that, I think you're better off taking the wrong. And I, our, our court system is so wicked. Uh, it's run by lost people. Why would we do that? Saints are going to judge the world. Why would we use a lost person? Why would we use a man in a dress to solve our problems for us? It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. And then, you know, and then even for you know, uh, Christians too, just how quick they are to even like just call the cops on people for stuff. That's ridiculous. Yeah. We ought to live our life. This is another message for another day. But listen, it ought to be a goal in your life to never use the police for anything. Amen. I know that sometimes we have to to protect ourselves. Okay? Because listen, I'm more worried, I'm more worried I, about our government than I am about bad people. Right. If somebody comes and tries to break into my house, I'm going to call the cops. Because I need to protect myself. But So why don't you just take care of yourself? I know. I'm, I'm worried about the government. If I do something wrong and I just shoot that guy in the wrong way. You know, I, I can take care of it myself. I've got firearms. Somebody tries to break in my house. I can take care of them. But you know what? They're, one of the first things they're going to ask is, why didn't you call the police? So, uh, you know, I'm going to call the police first. Not because I'm worried about that guy. Because I'm worried about our stupid government right. that doesn't let people protect themselves. And so, you know, we do. We, we, we have to do those things. You know, if somebody's giving you trouble, you can't just go beat them up. You'll get in trouble with the law. So, you know, sometimes we have to do that, but we ought to avoid it at all costs. Amen. These people, you know, sometimes, like I said, sometimes they're necessary. And listen, not all, not all policemen are bad. There's good guys who do it for the right reason. But understand, the, you know, a lot of these policemen, you know, these are people that have been raised in the public school system that are lost, that have wrong ideas, and they get out of hand sometimes because, you know, they're people. And, and that's why we need to try to avoid them uh, using them at all cost. And when I see Israel, God's people, you know, who even during this time, you know, Rome kind of let them do what they wanted to do. They, they took advantage of, you know, they took advantage of their wickedness. They used it to their advantage. And it makes me sick. And it makes me sick when God's people would use bad laws to their advantage. Our country has some really bad laws that are just wrong. And when we would use those to our advantage, when a woman would divorce her husband just because it's easy in this country, 
Just because it's legal, that's wicked. You're, you, you're going to use these wicked laws to hurt your husband? You know, the fact that just because you're done with them, you're sick of them, you want to get a new guy, and then you want him to, you know, the fact that our stupid government will call, let, you know, make him pay you child support and alimony, that you know, you're going to take advantage of that, and you call yourself a Christian, you're wicked. I'm sorry. Listen, when my wife and I, we had kids, we did it with the understanding that we were going to stay together. And if she just decides, I'm not beating her, I'm not cheating on her, I'm not doing anything, maybe I'm just boring or something, you know, maybe she finds another guy that's better looking or something, and she decides she's going to leave me, first of all, that's wicked. Our court shouldn't even let it happen, but they will. And you know what? I shouldn't have to pay her a dime of child support. And you've got all these stupid women out there, oh, you know, they're your kids too. Yeah. And so then they can stay in my house. And I'll take care of them. And... She shouldn't get a dime. But you know what, ladies? If you want to take advantage of the laws in this country, you can do just like the Jews did when they crucified Jesus, and you can do it. You can take advantage of bad laws and force your husband to pay alimony and child support when he, he shouldn't have to. Welcome to America, people. And so it's just, it's just, it's just the way it is. It's, it's wrong. And so, you know, the Jews, they wanted the Romans to put Jesus to death. I think part of that is because they didn't want to answer to the believing Jews. You know, they, they didn't want to deal with the trouble from them. And so, you know, let's put it all on them. Let's put it on Rome and let them deal with it. And everybody's scared of Rome. Nobody's going to say anything to them if they do it. And so, uh, look at verse 9. It says, And when he went into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, uh, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. So Pilate, you know, he's, he thinks he's got all the power. You know, Jesus isn't answering his questions because Jesus has already been, you know, through a mock trial. Jesus shouldn't have to answer these foolish you know, questions. He shouldn't have to answer these accusations that are based on absolutely nothing. And yet he's asking them these questions. And Pilate's like, you know, I've got the power to do this. I can crucify you. I can let you go. You better talk to me. You better give me what I want. But Jesus knew otherwise. Like, hey, if you've got anything, it's because it's been given you. So don't think, you know, Jesus wasn't scared of Pilate one bit. And notice the Jews were the ones who had delivered Jesus up, and I believe were the ones who had committed the greater sin. Notice how he said, uh, Thou could have, couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. It was the Jews that delivered them to Jesus, and he said they hath the greater sin. And you know, I don't know what people do with that verse. It's like, well, all sins are equal. Sin, sin. Listen, some sins are greater than other sins. And when the Jews delivered Jesus up to the Romans, that was a huge sin. Yeah. It was huge. It was one that cursed them. And you know what? They gladly accepted the curse. They were fine with it. And, but it was, it was a great, great sin. And they committed the greater sin. Some sins are worse than others. Some sins come with greater consequences and greater penalties than others. You know, sin's a sin when it comes to are you a sinner? Okay, any sin that you've ever committed makes you a sinner. Yeah. That's why the Bible says, you know, if you committed any any sin is a transgression of the law, and if you've committed any sin, you are a transgressor of the law. And people they use that to prove that, you know, all, you know, sin sin it's all the same. That's ridiculous. That's not what it's saying. That verse is just showing that we're all transgressors. We all need to get saved, whether you've committed the big sins or whether you've committed the little sins. Amen. And so there are, there are some sins that are much, much bigger than others. And so, you know, these Romans, I believe that, I, I, you know, it's clear throughout the Bible after this, they were always crediting the Jews for killing Jesus, even though it was actually the Romans that executed Jesus, because it was the Jews that delivered him up to the Romans. And understand these Romans, they were just used by the Jews like a pack of wild dogs. 
Once again, they had no moral. The Jews or the Romans, they had no interest in Jesus. They weren't worried about Jesus because Jesus hadn't been leading any rebellions like they were accusing him of. Jesus hadn't caused any problems anywhere he went. All he did was just threaten the you know, establishment because you know, they were lying and he's preaching truth. And so they did. They delivered these people. To, they delivered Jesus up to them. And they were. They were just like a pack of wild, angry dogs. They're just you know, enjoying putting a man to death. Yeah, and even if it wasn't just G, you know, the fact that it was Jesus, even if it would have just been a regular man, you know, a thief, it was pretty sick the way they acted in this whole thing. It was, it was a sick thing that they did, but that's just what they were. They were a bunch of lost animals. They didn't have God in their life. You know, they didn't know the Scriptures like the Jews did, and yet they acted like that, and it was very barbaric for them to turn them over like that. And so, um, verse 12 says, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Look at this. Now all of a sudden it's like the Jews are friends with Caesar. Wicked Caesar, who has conquered their land, you know, they're, they're using that against, against Pilate. You know, if you don't kill him, you're not Caesar's friend. Put, really putting the pressure on the coward Pilate. Verse 13, when Pilate... Therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Look at the Jews' support for Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Why would they say that? Why would they kiss the rear of a wicked, horrible government? Why would they do that? You know, they did it because you know, they were cowards. They did it because you know they were scared. They allowed, they submitted to the wickedness, and now they're even using it to their advantage. And you know, th and this attitude makes me so sick. It reminds me of pastors today who are bringing politicians into their churches. They bring politicians in their churches, kissing their big toe. Why? Because it's like they're scared of them. Amen. It's like these people, they know, they know deep down inside that you know a tribulation's coming. They know that the time is coming where what we do, what we teach, it's going to be illegal. And it's like they're trying to make friends with these people. You know, hey, we're not dangerous. Hey, we're on your side. Hey, we support you. And they do. And just because somebody is a stinking Republican, they think it's okay to have them in their church. And you know, I think about our governor, Bruce Rauner. He's the villain. Bruce Rauner. The, he, he has been... Recently, somebody sent me a picture. They had him in their church. They sent me their picture with him. I got a picture with Bruce Rauner. They had him in their church for like a God and Country Sunday. Should have just called it Country Sunday. It left God out of it. Because he has, I'm telling you, Bruce Rauner has nothing to do with God in a good way. So, but he's a Republican. <coughs> he's a Republican. I can't even stand to say the word. But. Bruce Rauner, I think it was just this week, did you hear about this abor abortion thing that he signed? I mean, Bruce Rauner, this you know Republican, if that means anything, governor, he, I, I had the, I forgot, I don't know what I did with the paper about it, but he signed something expanding Medicaid coverage to help women get abortions. I mean, they're saying like 3,800 to 12,000 more abortions will happen in this state because of that bill that he passed. And you know what? Bruce Rauner, he's been publicly pro-choice from the beginning. He's always been pro-choice. But because he's a Republican, it's okay for Baptists to have him in their church and honor the man. Just because he's a Republican. They wouldn't do it with the Democrat. But they'll do it for a Republican, even if he's for abortion. And you know, and he, you know, and he acted like it was with great sorrow. He had to do that, but you know, it just it wasn't fair 
that it was easier for rich women to get an abortion than poor women. And listen, it shouldn't be easy for anybody Amen. to get an abortion. But you know what? Poor people got enough working against them. The last thing they need is murder you know, on, their, on their list of offenses. You know, be killing, be killing their babies like that. And just to, you know, and I expect it from politicians. Listen, Bruce Rauner is a Chicago Republican. That would be a Democrat anywhere else in the country. And, I, and, you know, these stinking Illinois preachers need to understand that. When they have these guys come in, the Republicans, they act like they're, you know, these godly people. Because most of them, even in Illinois, are you know, against abortion. But most of these guys will be a Democrat in most other states. And Bruce Rauner would be a Democrat in just about any other state. And, and I, expect, I expect these politicians to be wicked. I expect that. Okay, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm disgusted with Bruce Rauner, don't get me wrong. But you know what I'm more disgusted with? I'm more disgusted with churches that are supporting this man, honoring him, you know, letting him stand behind their pulpit. Just because they're just trying to get in good with the government. Oh, you know, we, you know, we want to be an influence. We want to reach out. You know, we, want, we want to preach to him. Maybe he'll get saved. You know, why would he think he needs to get saved? You're bringing him in front of everybody and honoring him in your church. What does he need to get saved for? You know? I mean, you really think that's going to work? First of all, he's a billionaire. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle Amen. than a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven. And then you do, you know, you got the fact that he's a politician. So who knows how many lies he's had to tell? You know, he's got all that working against him. I mean, just bona fide liar. And you know, it just it it makes me sick. It makes me sick. When are the, when are these churches going to wake up and stop with this nonsense? Amen. The evangelicals they started all of it, and then the Southern Baptists got into it. The trendies picked up on it, and then you know, I remember I, Chapel was one of the first what I consider fundamental Baptists that I saw doing it. And it was like, after he did it, a bunch of these other ones got on board. And it's a joke. It's wrong. We're not, we're not going to do that here. Amen. You know, if Bruce Ryder came to this church, I'm not going to be disrespectful to him. But I'm not going to honor him. I'm going to treat him like any other visitor. And I'm going to preach the truth. And you know what? He would never come to this church. But if he did, I'm throwing abortion in there somewhere. I'm, I'm, talk, I'm, talk, I'm talking about abortion. And, you know, uh, and... Said so even the Republicans in Illinois were disgusted by that. And you know what else makes me sick about this too? You know, I'm kind of going off on a rabbit trail here. But he's going to be a one-term governor. I don't. But I don't. Know. You know, we can't underestimate the stupidity of Christians. Because you know what they're just going to do? They're going to get some wacko psycho liberal to run against him now. And then, well, we've got to vote for Bruce Rauner because we can't have this, you know, wacko psycho liberal. But you know what? What can they do worse than what Bruce Rauner just did? Yeah, he's already a wacko, sicko, you know. I mean, just, you just, you know, how barbaric and perverted to, to sign a bill like that. And taxpayer funded abortions, that's supposed to be illegal. But it, it, it's legal. And Illinois, we ought to be, we ought to be ashamed. Our, our, we ought to be hanging our heads in embarrassment and disgrace. And to think that a church would bring Caesar in and honor him like that, or bring Pontius Pilate in and honor him in the church, I don't see how it's any different than these Jews using this wicked government to get what they want. Right. It, makes me, it makes me sick. Verse 17, I need to get off that. It says, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side one um, on either side one and Jesus in the midst and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews and this title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in the Hebrew and Greek and Latin then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate write not the king of the Jews but that he said I am the king of the Jews Pilate answered what I have written I have written, I don't know for sure, but I think part of the reason he put the whole king of the Jews thing on there, I think that's his accusation, basically. Because of the fact that, you know, you don't just to get make, you know, make yourself king. And you know what, did Jesus try doing that? No, he didn't. 
And so they, they put that as kind of the accusation. And then, you know, the Jews, they kind of took offense to that because, like, you know, he's not our king. You know, put it that he said he's the king of the Jews, but the thing is, Jesus never said that. And so the Pilate's like, you know, what I've written, I've written. You know, that, that's there. And it's like the, these Jews... You know, they want, just like they do today, it's like they wanted to distance themselves from Jesus. You know, he's not one of us. That's why, you know, that's why they said that he was born of fornication. You know, and that's why even today in the Talmud, you know, they try to teach that, you know, he was the child, illegitimate child of a Roman soldier with Mary. That's why they say those things like that, because they want to distance themselves. They don't want to even admit that Jesus was a Jew. They hate him that much still to this day. They hate him. And so... You know, this and um, Matthew or verse 23 or Matthew. Um, well, let's go ahead and read. Um, lost my spot. Now let's read verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam woven from top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Turn over to um, Matthew, or Psalms 22. Psalms 22, verses 16 through 18. Now, right here, this is, you know, this is an amazing thing, because I mean, obviously, we don't have time to go through all the Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled at the crucifixion. But some of these that are mentioned in the book of John are just, they're so specific. It, sh it should have left zero doubt for anyone that this was in fact the Messiah. That it was in fact God's will. It says in Psalms twenty two sixteen, for dogs have compassed me. Look at that, for dogs have compassed me. I guess we're talking about the Roman soldiers. Yeah. So you've been pretty mean to them. Yeah, they were, they were a bunch of savage, vile dogs. That's what they were. Dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, folks, that is so specific. Okay, because understand, too, you know, they pierced my hands and my feet. Well, that was a Roman thing okay, that the Romans did. But this was written in Psalms before the Romans were in power or doing their thing before the Romans was, were a thing, it was prophesied that that was going to happen, that he was going to be compassed by dogs, that they were going to pierce his hand and feet, and that they were going to cast lots upon his vesture. Okay, You don't just guess on something like that. that, you, that there's no way that's a coincidence. It's just statistically impossible for something like that to be a coincidence. And this is a psalm. Okay? Now, listen, all of us, we're not, all, we're not all as good at memorizing Scripture as we probably should. But you know one thing we all know? We all know songs pretty well, don't we? And this was something they sang about. Right. And I, I wonder, you know, what in the world did, were they thinking when they sang this? You know, before the crucifixion. But either way, they sang it. They knew the words. You know, I'd like to think that there'd be somebody that would have been there. You know, one Jew... You know, looking on that and just seeing that. And, I don't know, maybe that psalm coming to his head. They pierced my hands and feet. He's got holes in his hands and his feet right now. You know, there he is compassed by the dogs, by wicked men. They're casting lots on his vesture. That's real specific. When they were casting lots on his vesture, I, you think that would have triggered the line of that song. Of that psalm, you think they would have remembered that? It's just, it's so, so specific. But those who don't believe in that Jesus is a Christ, you know, they're not an error of the truth. They reject the truth. Yeah. There are some things that I can see where people could easily go into error. You know, where people could make a mistake. Some things that are kind of hard to be understood. But there are some things. If you don't get it, it's because you reject the truth. You don't want to get it. And anybody. You know, you know, these people who say Jews believe the Old Testament, that's a bunch of garbage. They reject the Old Testament. If they believe the Old Testament, they would take Psalms 22 and they would have to say Jesus is the Messiah. But they reject it. They, they reject Psalms chapter 22. They reject Psalms chapter 69. They reject many of the Psalms. And, uh, and 
you know, it's just it's double talk for people to say that. People who do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they are not in error. They have not made a mistake. They have rejected truth. And that's all there is to it. And so, look at verse 25. It says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own house. Notice here, this is just kind of an interesting thing. And the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about this. But, you know, I've, I've been preaching about how, you know, young men, you know, they need to be a part of their home until, until they become a husband. And people are like, oh, you know, that's not necessary. And then they use Jesus as an example all the time. But understand, I still believe Jesus was a part of his house. It doesn't mean, you know, you never get to leave home. You know, you got to sit around the house. You know, you, you can still do stuff, go places. But yet, I believe that, the, you know, you, ought, you still ought to be submissive to authority. And Jesus, as the oldest son, it appears, you know, he was the one probably responsible for his mom because, you know, it, it appears from the scripture, Joseph was no longer around. Joseph was probably dead. And even while he's on the cross, he's thinking about his mother and what does he do? He kind of commissions John to take care of his mother. Why did he do that? Well, because he was, he was still a part of his house. You know, that, that, that was his mother. Jesus didn't have his own house. He didn't have his own wife and his own kids. He did, that, that wasn't what he came to earth for. And so I think he uh, was being responsible for his mother. He was, I think it's safe to say, you know, he was kind of the head of the house. In a lot of ways, because his father, his earthly father, was gone, probably, probably had died. So, um, you know, I believe there's a lot of significance to that. I think he's just taking care of his earthly responsibilities that he had, even though he's about to die. And so, look at verse 28. It says after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, "I thirst." Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Once again, we have another prophecy fulfilled, one that is just scary specific. Psalm sixty nine twenty one. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Another prophecy about Jesus. Just, uh, just an amazing thing. These things cannot be coincidences. These are things I, I'd like to ask a Jew. You know, what do you, what do you think that's talking about? You know, what do you think Psalms twenty two is talking about? What do you think Psalm sixty nine is talking about? You know, was somebody just setting that up? You know, was that just something that you know? You think the Romans knew about Psalm sixty nine and Psalms twenty two? They didn't know about that. Jesus knew about it, but did Jesus tell them to do those things? No, they just. They did it. You know, you know why they did it? Because it was in the Word of God. And nothing's going to change the Word of God. If the Word of God says it, mark it down like past history. It's as good as happened already. And so it, those things all happened because the Bible said they were going to happen. And nothing was going to change that. Nothing was going to stop that. And so it's kind of like when Jesus, remember when he, they borrowed those animals so he, that he could ride in uh, on that triumphal entry? You know, they told him the animals would be, you know, would be returned by themselves. It's like, how did Jesus get those animals to go back like they were supposed to? You know, is he like, you know, have animal whispering skills? Did, you know, did he tell them something? No, the very fact that Jesus said that would happen was all it took. That was it. Jesus said they would be returned, they would go back, and that was all Jesus needed to do. I believe when he said that, that was it. I don't think he like instructed the animals after that or anything. I don't think he needed to. He said it was going to happen, therefore it was going to happen. No, no two ways about it. No changing it. Why? Because he is God and when he speaks, it is the word of God. So uh, you know, his, his word is not going to return void. So uh, look at verse uh, 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. 
Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. And when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. Um, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the Scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another Scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So first of all, the thing I want to show you here is, and I, I've, I've covered this before, but I want to repeat it, that Jesus did not die on a Friday. He died on a Wednesday. Okay. Now, just the fact that he said he would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights is enough to prove he was born on a Wednesday. But where the Friday thing comes from is because of the fact that it says in verse 31, it talks about you know they wanted to get him down because it was a preparation for the Sabbath. So that's why people say it had to have been Friday because the Sabbath actually started you know in the e Friday evening is when the Sabbath started. And so people like, so it had to have been Friday because it was the Sabbath, but understand it was also the Passover. It was the preparation. And we're not going to take time to read it, but if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, when it gives the instructions for the Passover, you had the Passover, and then the next seven days was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it was a Sabbath week. They were not supposed to do any work for that entire week. And so, the, because it was the Passover, that was the preparation. That was a preparation. The only work they were supposed to do during that time was just basically you know, preparing the food that they would eat. So they needed to get him off the cross before the Sabbath week began, not the Sabbath day. Jesus died on the Passover, and it, was a, it happened to be a Wednesday, and three days later, he rose early on a Sunday morning. And so, um, don't have time to go into all the Old Testament scriptures to just prove that, but that's where the Friday comes from, is right here in John because it mentions the Sabbath. But understand, you know, it was a Sabbath week, not the, not the Sabbath day. So anyway, um, look at verse 37. Okay, Look at verse 37. It says, And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Okay, they, He mentions that after they pierce his side, it mentions, the scriptures fulfill, or it mentions uh, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So let me ask you, was that prophecy fulfilled right then? Yes. Partially. It was, it was partially fulfilled. Okay, because let me let me show you uh, in Revelation chapter one. Turn over to Revelation chapter one. Uh, I forgot what verse it is. I didn't I didn't write it down. Verse seven, yeah, Revelation verse one, uh, chapter one, verse seven. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. I'm quoting it. And they also which pierced him. Okay? And they shall mourn for him. Let me, let me make sure I'm saying it right. Yeah, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And it was also, that was also prophesied in Zechariah, I believe it was, that they will look on him whom they've pierced. So understand. You know, okay, well, what's happening? Because I believe there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it's referring to something in the future, but here it's saying they look at him and they pierced. Well, what's that talking about? Well, it's because this is when they actually pierced him. Okay? Because there's a prophecy, that, an end times prophecy, that they will look on him whom they pierced. Okay? Well, in Zechariah, they hadn't pierced him yet, had they? So right here, this is the part of the you know, prophecy that makes the other part make sense. This is when they actually pierced him. And so one of these days when Jesus Christ returns, they were going to look on him whom they pierced. Okay. And this here in John chapter 19 was when they actually pierced him. Now, who was it that pierced him? It was a Roman soldier, right? But notice how God gives the Jews credit for piercing him. Kind of an interesting thing right now. And people do, they'll take that verse too and talk about that's when all Israel gets saved. When Jesus Christ returns at Armageddon and they're going to see Him and they're all going to believe. It says all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. You know why? Because they're scared. Because Jesus is getting ready to pour His wrath out on this earth. 
Fire and brimstone is about to start falling, and there is about to be some serious judgment that comes on this earth. Okay, and I'm sorry, Revelation 1 7 is a rapture passage. And every eye is going to see him when he returns in the clouds. And you know, the kindred of the earth are going to wail. Us, we're going to be caught up with him. And that's why we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We're ready for that. And, uh, and we're looking for that. But yeah, when you read that, it looks like it was fulfilled. But understand, it's just showing this is when they pierced him because that prophecy was one that was, they had talked about, one that was coming, but they hadn't done that yet. They hadn't pierced him yet. So this is where they pierced him. And so someday when he returns, they're going to look on him whom they pierced. And so that's what that's, that's what that's talking about exactly. So it was the part of the fulfillment because before they could look on him whom they pierced, they've got to pierce him. And so that was, that was when they pierced him. So, uh, and it's so, you know, it's showing that it's, you know, it's not necessarily the fulfillment of the prophecy, but it's just showing that the one whom they pierced was Jesus. And it's interesting too, in Zechariah, I, I should have wrote the reference down, it says they will look on, or it says me whom they pierced. It was God talking there, wasn't it? Right. You know, I want to know what the, I like to know what the Jews say about that. I think they would agree in Zechariah that's God talking. It says and they will look on me whom they pierced. And then it says, and they will mourn for him. You know, what's going on here? That's kind of the whole Trinity thing there. You know, God sometimes speaks on behalf of all of them, or they, they can all speak on behalf of each other. You know, but the fact is, you know, it was God. My, my dad always used that one for Jehovah's Witnesses, too. And they never really liked that and appreciated that. It was one of them, I think he put that verse in the sign one time, and uh, he, uh, he, what he did, he, he put something about, you know, Jesus, a sign on there just to tweak the Jehovah's Witnesses about Jesus being God, something about the deity of Christ, and he put that scripture reference. And I had a lady from the Jehovah's Witness uh, church that called and was asking about that. You know, and she was new to the Jehovah's Witness. It was an interesting conversation, but I said, yeah, it says right there, they will look on me whom they pierced. And I asked her, I said, was that Jesus talking or is that God talking? But I was like, who got pierced? You know, it's, it, you know, she didn't know what to do with it. And I don't know what any, and I don't know what any of them uh, do with it. I know what to do with it. They ignore it like they do. They reject it like they do the rest of the Bible. But anyway, so, uh, you know, verse 38 says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of burr and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jews preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And you know, I've been to the place where Jesus was crucified, and it is just right around the corner from there is the place, the, the tomb where he laid. And, you know, it's just kind of an interesting thing because when it came time, you know, we kind of look at Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, you kind of look at them as cowards. You know, they're Pharisees, but yet they believe in Christ. You know, it was Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night. They're like these secret disciples these secret followers and you know we're kind of down on them for that but notice you know after crucifixion time who was it that claimed the body you know you got jo joseph of arimathea and nicodemus the disciples were nowhere to be found but the secret followers of christ actually came through during that time and they and they buried him and, and they uh they took care of those things and so uh it, it it ends right there you know they got him in there before the preparation because, uh, you know, the sepulcher was nigh at hand. But um, the story of the crucifix crucifixion, it's so interesting because, you know, it's a story, it, it convicts, and it should convict. You know, it was our sin that caused that to happen to him. He, he did that for our sin, and it, so it causes some guilt. We ought to feel guilty. It, uh, it, we ought to see, you know, it, it's our sin we are, that we were guilty of, they got Jesus that punishment. Yet at the same time, while we read that, 
it thrills us too, doesn't it? You know, you, you kind of get excited. You know, we sang, before this, we sang the old rugged cross. We sing about the cross. We sing, you know, happy, uplifting songs like at the cross. It almost seems, you know, on one hand, it almost seems wrong to sing about the cross because it was so horrible what Jesus went through. But you know what? We glory in the cross because that's why we can go to heaven. And you know what? Even though it was a horrible death, it was one that he did willingly. And the Bible said he did it for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He did that for us. And you know what? I believe God wants us to enjoy our salvation. He wants us to joy. And he, I, I think he's fine with us being thrilled and singing about what he did for us on the cross and rejoicing in that. And we ought to do that. We ought to never get uh, over it. We ought to be excited about it. And it does. It, it, we get excited while feeling guilty and bad at the same time. That's an amazing thing about the story of the crucifixion. We're sad our sin caused him such pain, but we are thrilled because he paid our debt. And we can go to heaven because of what happened right there in John chapter 19. That's why I'm going to heaven because I, of what Jesus did in John chapter 19. You've got all these people, that all these religions that want to talk about their works. You know, I don't know how you do that and you read the story of the crucifixion. Shame on you. Amen. Shame on you for thinking your works can get you to heaven. All these people, even Baptists, you know, work salvation is coming in. It's, it's in Baptist churches. It's in. It's, it's not coming. It is in there. People are, one way or the other, they're making it about works. Shame on you. Read the story of the crucifixion. That is why I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm good enough. Not because I turned from my sin. No, because Jesus paid for my sins. Amen. Because of the cross. That is why I'm going to heaven. And so we, thank God for that. Don't glory in your works. We glory in the cross. We don't glory in our changed life. We glory in the fact that Jesus paid for all my sins. And we thank Him for it. And so, with that, let's all stand together.